Okay, everybody. Welcome to How to Use CSS and WordPress. Hope everybody's having a great time at WordCamp. How many people, this is our first WordCamp? Wow, all of you, that's awesome. Yay, <laughs> that makes me excited. All right, so a little bit about me. My name is Suzette Frank. You can find me on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn as Suzette Frank, but with a CK. Um, I also love it if you take pictures of me and tweet during my talk. I totally dig on that. I just do. I just dig on it. Um, I am an HTML and CSS teacher uh, with Girl Develop at the Los Angeles chapter. I live in Los Angeles, California. That's where I, I was born and raised and grew up there. I'm also a freelance, freelancing front-end developer. I was born in Hollywood, resided in South California, and I have over 20 years of coding experience in web development. I've developed over 300 WordPress sites with different all custom themes, and I've spoken at 25 different WordCamps across the US and Canada. I'm a regular contributor also on WP Water Cooler, which is a weekly <coughs> podcast show with 10 different developers that just get around and talk about WordPress. So anything like anything that's happening in the WordPress community, we'll talk about it. Um, it's a lot of fun. We've been doing it for about three years, and we have over 5 million views. So somebody out there likes it. So that's pretty, it's a fun thing to do. For hobbies, I like crocheting, and I'm very much into adult coloring books lately. Just all crazy coloring books. A lot of fun. So my goal today is to teach you at least one thing that will change how you work forever. So hopefully you get at least one thing that will change how you work, because there is so much good about CSS. <laughs> so the first thing, just a brief overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to cover, first of all, what is CSS, CSS3, using CSS and WordPress, and CSS resources. But before we get started, I want to know how many people here already know HTML? And how many know HTML? Okay, awesome. How many people know CSS? Awesome. How many know how to use CSS in WordPress? Sort of. Okay, well good, you're in the right place. So I wasn't sure like how much new stuff, because I teach CSS classes, so I do have a little bit, so I'll just go through those. But there's a little bit, it might be review for some of you. So a little bit about CSS and CSS3. It is a cascading style sheet language. Um, it's used with, with HTML to give style and design to HTML templates. CSS3 is the latest evolution of CSS, which was meant to add on to the previous version, which was 2.1, not 2.0. But pretty much when we say CSS, um, there's not really a version attached to it. It's just CSS. It's usually CSS 2.1 with some 3 added in. It's, it's all in there, Some a little bit here, a little bit there. CSS3 is backwards compatible with all versions of WordPress, so you don't have to worry if you know a version like CSS 2.1 or C CSS 2, you don't have to worry about using, you can still use that in CSS 3. So that's fine. And so in WordPress, CSS is most often put into a plain text file called style.css that is in the, the, either the parent theme, the starter theme, or the child theme folder in WP content. And most themes have an edit CSS option, or you can install a plugin to add your own CSS. Now, if you caught the talk before me, she talked all about child themes, and it was awesome. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about child themes, but I'm also going to talk about some other ways that you can include CSS without, in, without creating a child theme. So if you haven't seen CSS code, I don't know if you can read that very well, but there's some example of CSS code. And we're going to go over some basic terminology. So syntax is said to be the order of how things appear with the proper punctuation. That's what's known as syntax. Selectors are, um, this is an example of a selector. A selector selects the HTML element, and it applies the styles to it the declarations, it has declarations that go with it. So here is the selector, and with the selector we have a group of declarations, and each declaration is one line. And one line is made up of a property and a value. 
So we have background color is a property here, and then black is a value. Same with color, and red is the value there. So it's always like that, and you can have as many of these statements or declarations as you like, but they all end with a semicolon. Spe That's true. It's just a good format to always. The last one doesn't have to have a semicolon, but it's just a good format to always put it. I'll find that I usually add something after and have to add the semicolon anyway. And then spaces and tabs are ignored in CSS, so you can kind of use them to line up. In this example here, I have the values lined up. Typically, that's not necessary. You can put the value over here or just with a space. But however, it's going to make it easiest for you to read it. Generally, I'll use tabs on the left to kind of indent the declarations, and then spaces on the right side to kind of space things out. So here's another example of the selector, selector with a property and value. We have H1, and then we have three declarations here. That one, I think that this is pretty much review for most of the people here. So there's a lot of properties, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but they are all listed right here. Or you can just Google it. Googling CSS, the name of the property, um, will also give you a lot of information about how you can use that property in your CSS. Um, just really quickly, CSS comments start with a slash asterisk and end with an asterisk slash, and they are ignored by the browser so that you can include them anywhere in CSS. And just a little bit about CSS specificity. That's a really hard word to say, by the way. Um, what it basically means is that the more specific the CSS, the more um, power that has to override other things. So IDs, anything that's an ID would override a class. Inline CSS overrides IDs. Important, which is generally a bad idea to use, you'll see this at the end of some declarations, and it means that that carries more weight than anything else. It's kind of, it's considered like a hacky, kind of janky way to do things, so it's generally frowned upon, but it does come in handy when you are trying to override things that might be in a plugin. Um, it's really helpful. So in general, the closest rule or, or declaration beats out remote declarations. So anything that's closer in proximity to the actual item that you're styling is going to have more weight on it than something that is linked to it. And then this is a really great article about um, just that thing that I can't say. So let's see how good you guys are. What color is this home? When, if you only have these rules apply to it, when all is said and done, what color do you think the home is? Do you think it's yellow, red, deep pink, or aqua? And it is aqua. Aqua is the right color. Because the first thing that you apply to it is the UL. The UL is deep pink. So first it makes everything deep pink. Then it has a class. So it makes everything with this corning class red, exactly. Then the ID, it would be yellow. But since we have really close to it, we have this anchor reference right here. And the A's are all aqua. So this would be aqua. <coughs> but here's the real bonus question. Oh, yeah, aqua. There we go. <laughs> And I was going to say, I don't know why it says yellow. Yeah, aqua yellow. Whoa. Oh, I ruined it. But the bonus color, does anyone know what color the bullet would be? <laughs> it's not yellow, by the way. Any clues on what color the bullet would be? This is an unordered list, in, in case you didn't know. So it will have a bullet in front of it. The bullet will be the color of the main nav which is yellow. So the bullet will be yellow, but the text will be aqua. And it will be, it'll uh, vary a little bit depending on your browser. Like not all browsers follow that with the bullets being different colors, but that's in general. All right, so that's, that's my quick overview of CSS. Has everyone here used um, Chrome developer tools or Firebug? Anyone not use it? 
a few people. Perfect. So um, how you would look at the CSS that makes up any page is there's, as part of Chrome, Chrome Developer Tools, you can do View Developer, Developer Tools, or right mouse click, Inspect Element, and what it will do is it will bring up this window on the bottom. And what's so awesome about this is that this is only in Chrome, but they do have Firebug for Firefox, which does something similar. Internet Explorer also has a similar thing where you can view the CSS. But if you click on this very first icon, this search, then you can point to anything on the page, and the HTML will be highlighted right here. And not only that, it also tells you right here the class that it is and the size. And then any of the CSS that goes with that element is showed up, shows up right here. And the good thing about this is that you can actually make changes to your CSS right here. And you, you can't save it, but just to see what things look like. You can change things like really quickly to see what they'll look like and then copy that style to your style.css. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about CSS3 modules, the fun stuff. Um, some things that they've added to the CSS3 specification are colors and transparency, CSS gradients, border radius or rounded corners, box shadow and text shadow, transformations and animations, web fonts and using at font base, and media queries also, and those are the building blocks of responsive design. We're going to cover some of these things here. So the first thing that we're going to cover is the CSS3 colors, which I love because the one thing that they added in CSS3 used to be that in CSS2, we had 17 color names like lime, red, black, white. Well, in CSS3, there are now 140 proper color names that are supported by all browsers. There's tomato, deep pink, magenta, violet, a lot of colors. If you do a search on Google, uh, W3Schools has a nice chart, but you can find the charts really easily with their hexadecimal equivalents of the names of the colors. Or you can go to that link. And then these, these are already available on SlideShare, and I'll, I'll post the link up as well. <coughs> There's a, in um, CSS2, we could specify red, green, blue values by specifying how much red, how much green, how much blue. That's one way that you can specify colors. Well, with CSS3, they've added an alpha. So you can actually specify the alpha channel like this, RGBA. So that stands for red, green, blue, alpha. So we have 255 red, zero green, zero blue. And this value here indicates the transparency of it. So it can be a value from zero. Zero would be completely transparent to one, would be completely opaque. So you can actually make it, this is about 50% if you do 0 0.5. So that'll make it about semi-transparent. So that's awesome. And the other thing that you can also do that you couldn't do before is specify hue, saturation, and lightness. And this is good if you're like really into graphics or you have Photoshop and it gives you the value when you pick a color. And you could specify that also with an alpha channel or without an alpha channel. You can just do HSL without the alpha and that will work fine. There's also a new opacity property that you can specify and it works just like the alpha but it's a property on its own just called opacity. And then there's another way to, this is a reference to um, show you all the different ways that you can specify colors in CSS3. Gradients. Gradients are pretty awesome. They're pretty easy to do. It used to be in the olden days, you would actually have to create this graphic and usually it would be like two pixels wide and then you would repeat it across. Does anyone remember doing that in the olden days? It was pretty tedious. But now we can just specify a background color and with, um, ignore this for right now, <laughs> web vendor prefixes. This bottom line, linear dash gradient, red, green, blue. You can specify it any color you'd like. 
and it will put color stops in here. So if you just specify three colors, it's going to just divide them equally among what's there. But you can actually get very granular and say that you want red at this color stop. And you can put a 1,000 colors in there. And there's actually, did I put it on here? Yes. I recommend this way, if you're going to create gradients in CSS, is use the ultimate CSS gradient generator, because then you can put as many color stomps as you like, and it's a very good uh, user interface for doing this. And once you have it looking like you like, or you can pick one of the pre-selected, it will generate all of the code for you, including the vendor prefixes. So I haven't talked about vendor prefixes, so let me go back to the previous page really quick. With CSS3, not all of the features that were part of the specification were made um, available in browsers right away. So what they did is they came up with this kind of hacky fix where you have to put the browser prefix. Moz is for Mozilla browsers. O is for Opera. And WebKit is Safari. Oh, it says at the end. Safari. <laughs> Durr. <laughs> But basically, um, you have to add these for the time being. In the future, they may be eliminated so that you, can only, you would only have to specify the last. So what it's doing, basically, is it's looking to see it's going through this. So your browser goes through this, and it says, am I a WebKit browser? Then I'll look at this. If not, it goes down the line until it sees whichever one applies to the browser that they're using. Make sense to everybody? Cool. So there's a gradient generator. And then also, along with that gradient generator, this is made by Colorzilla. Colorzilla makes a really good oh. extension for Chrome that's just an eyedropper that will allow you to pick off any color from, the pa from any web page. So if you're trying to match a color, um, Colorzilla, let me see if I can show you an example of that really quick because it's a really useful tool. I'm pretty dependent on it. So here's what it looks like. And I wanted to pick this weird purple. And now that color, the hexadecimal color, is now copied to my clipboard. It's pretty handy. That's Colorzilla. All right. All right, border radius. How, how many people here have used border radius? Oh, a lot of you guys are all experts now. So basically, for those that haven't used it yet, is it used to be very hard to create rounded borders before CSS3. You had to draw a circle in Photoshop. This is how I used to do it. I used to draw a photo in Photoshop, a circle in Photoshop, cut it into four parts, and then stick each one of those corners like in a piece, in a table on an HTML page. It's so dated, I just don't even want to go into it. <laughs> but luckily now we have this where we can just specify border radius. This is a shorthand version, border dash radius. And then you would specify each corner starting from the top left going clockwise down if you're doing shorthand. So this would be left, top left, top right, bottom right, and then bottom left. Or you can specify each one individually. But basically, that just kind of indents the corner so that it looks rounded. And you can use pixels or percent. If you use a percentage of 100%, it will give you a circle. It will make your, it's really good to use on images if you want to make the image into a circle. You would give it a border radius of 100%, and it, it just does it. It's really cool. Clockwise. Top left, then clockwise. Sorry. Yeah, top left, then clockwise. Yeah. Whoops. And border radius is pretty well supported, um, but they still indicate that you should use the vendor prefixes with that as well. There is something, there's another tool called border-radius.com. And if you want to use this, you can specify with pixels which, how many pixels you would like each corner to be. And it spits out the vendor prefix with all the right code for you. So you can copy that right into your style sheet. All right, so now using CSS3 in WordPress. 
So the places where you can put CSS and WordPress is either in an installed themes, custom CSS option, which I won't go into that because it's different for each theme. I, I think WooThemes has an option to add edit CSS, and that's really good if you just want to do a few quick little changes. There's also Jetpack's Edit CSS module. So if you don't know what Jetpack is, it's the suite of plugins, and the suite of plugins is made by Automatic. And it enables a lot of the features that are only available on WordPress.com, available to your WordPress self-hosted WordPress.org blog. Um, so that's really good. So one of the modules they have is Edit CSS. And this is my favorite of all the options I'm gonna off that I'm gonna offer you here. And the reason is, is because it's pretty advanced. You can actually write SAS in edit CSS, which when, once you get more advanced, you can write SAS and you, or less, um, which are something that will take your CSS and pre-process it. There's also a plugin called Simple Custom CSS Plugin, which is really good. Um, it's just simple, it just does what it says. The one, another reason I just remember why Jetpack was a little bit better is because they have version history. So you know how you have revision history on posts and pages. It has the same thing with your CSS in the Jetpack Edit CSS. Simple Custom CSS doesn't have an undo or revisions, so it's just whenever you hit that update, that's what it is. You can also put CSS right into your post or page editor, and I'll show you how to do that. You can also put it in your child theme style.css. That's the, the WordPress recommended way to do it. Um, and there's also, if you were to take like um, your own theme, a starter theme like a basic theme or a Genesis theme, excuse me, and make it your own, you could put it in the starter theme style.css as well. So here's what the Jetpack's Edit CSS module looks like. Once you activate this in Jetpack, um, it gives you an Edit CSS option that's under Appearance. And then this is what it looks like, and it has all this. And this is where you start to add your CSS. This is basically a comment. And then below that, you can put, and I have some in here already. And this is what makes this so valuable. It's the preprocessor. Um, once you get more advanced, the mode is add-on because you can specify whether you want this to replace all of your all of your theme style.css or add to it. Right now, the default is just to add on to what you already have. And the media width default, this is more for responsive design. But those options make it super useful, I think. <coughs> all right, yeah, and it's uh, under appearance, edit CSS once you get there, and then there's the plugin simple custom CSS, which looks very similar to the edit CSS in Jetpack, um, but you'll notice you don't have any fancy options and there's no revisions. So just be aware of that. When you hit that update custom CSS, it will add to whatever and you can undo it. But it's a good way to add CSS just to your theme if you want to overwrite something quickly. And there's also the inline editor in CSS. So under text view, if you're in text view, you can add, and this is the syntax. I don't know if you guys can see that, but I have a div here in HTML, and I've just added a space and an attribute of style in quotes equals quotes color, and you put your declarations in here. And the last one, again, doesn't have to have the semicolon but the other ones do, so you can put as many as you want. This is also considered kind of janky, but it's kind of like something you would have to do like on the fly just to fix something really quick. Um, you would really want to put this into like an edit CSS or an, into a theme file. But like if you just want, this is just changing this to big and red and it ends there and it's just a really quick way to do it. And um, that's the quickest way to get it in there. Oh, I didn't know I had the format there. So it's just p style equals and then quotes with all the property and value pairs in there. And it's considered hank hacky jank hanky janky bad practice, but it works in a fix. So let's talk about child themes a little bit. So child themes inherit the, the parents functionality 
Modifications are not overwritten when the parent theme updates when you create a child theme. It's the best, of, best method for extensive modifications to create a child theme. And there's a lot of information on creating child themes on the codex. Um, this is the best place if you go to the codex, you'll find all the information that's current and up to date there. There's also, and a lot of people don't know this, but there's a few pretty good child theme plugins. So in case you don't have FTP access or you don't want to mess with your files, you can install one of these um, child theme creator plugins and it will take your currently active theme, whatever it is, make a copy of it, the folder, and this, it will add a style.css and a functions.php to it as well. So, um, Orbisius, one click, is another one. Um, there's Child Theme Configurator is another one, and they all do slightly different things. But I actually just use those. They're, re they're really quick and dirty to create a child theme. And ex here's an example of a starter theme. Underscores is considered a starter theme, and it's said to be a thousand hour head start. So basically, this has like all the basic building blocks that you need for a theme. It's already responsive. You just add whatever you need to add to it, um, and you create it. And this is, if you go to underscores.me, you can have SAS, you can have just a plain one also, and then just make your own custom theme from there. The problem with using a starter theme is that there's nothing to update it to. You have to manually update your starter themes. So if there's something in WordPress core that breaks it, it probably won't happen for a few years that that would happen, but you want to make sure if you create a theme using a starter theme, you're kind of responsible for it after that. So where do you not put CSS? This, I think, should be banished, especially not so much for developers, but when you send this to end users and they start Googling things about how to put things in their functions.php, and their style.css, you can use this to edit your files directly on the server. The problem is, is that there's no undo and there's no revision history. So if you are playing around with this editor and you put something in your functions.php, mostly is what happens, you can white screen your site and not be able to log into it. And then you'll have to do some wizardry. So don't use that, and there's actually easy ways to disable that if you're handing off a site to a client. There's just a few lines of code that you can add to your WP config that will disable, will just remove that from the menu, because it's pretty dangerous. Excuse me. <laughs> so the other place you don't want to put CSS is a lot of places, if you look at tutorials about CSS, they'll have you link to a style sheet in the header. That's not considered the right way for WordPress. In WordPress, they want you to use it an NQ function. Um, yeah, which I didn't go into here. The NQ function, next. But I do have some resources for you guys. Um, CSS Zen Garden was a website that came out when CSS was first invented, I think 2000 and I forget, early 2000s. Um, but it's, it's meant to show like one web page done in a bunch of different ways just with CSS. So it's a good uh, learning resource. You can do a lot of research on that page. So it's basically just kind of like an empty like page and then they style it like really a varying different ways. So completely different and it's just a good um, kind of showcase of what you can actually do with CSS. There's also the W3 schools. I recommend them. I use them for a reference site. If you Google anything CSS, it's probably the first or second link that comes up. It's a really good resource. Um, for not only learning CSS, but also for referencing. Um, like if you need to look something up. Because CSS is kind of like a language. You have to look up all the different um, elements of it so you can find out what it means. And it's kind of like, as long as you know the basic structure that there's a declaration that has a selector with property and values, you just need to find out what those different property and values are that you can use on the element that you're working on. 
Also, I'm going to recommend CSS Tricks and CSS Tricks Almanac. A lot of people know about CSS Tricks. It's written by Chris Coyer, who knows a lot about CSS. And he writes really useful articles about how to use CSS and SAS. And he also uh, taps into SVG a little, which is pretty interesting. And he has a really good resource there for that. And there's also Girl Develop It. They're all over. I'm not sure about in Canada how they are here. I don't think they're here. But in the US, they have a lot of um, chapters all over in major cities where you can take classes. I think Ladies Learning Code was one that they had here that was really good. So basically, that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, so for animation? Yes. Yeah. Uh, too much noise I would say if it's something that you want to call attention to, um, you do it in a subtle way, kind of like a subtle way. Um, there is also, um, I can't remember the name of the site. It was like a chain, Ling's website, car website. Does anyone know that? No, OK. He has a, like every animation on, on his page. It's like outrageous. But you don't want your page to look like that. So I'd recommend just keep it very minimal. And CSS3 animations, they run all the time, unless you tell them to stop. So it's. Yeah, so far I've been using it on like drop-down menus, mm -hmm. where you can put like a transition, like especially with the opacity. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you can sort of change the menu instead of just having it appear. Oh, that's neat. Um, Do you put any of your work online? Um, so far it's just been assigned. Oh. Well, that's great. You should get a GitHub account and put some of your code online. I'd like to see it. <laughs> yes? Uh, what's the uh, uh, browser compatibility with CSS3, particularly uh, uh, browser radius and uh, color gradients, or CSS3? Well, CSS gradients are really well supported. There are certain features, if you dig into CSS gradients, where you can specify the angle of the gradient and the the, um, where it starts and stops. Some of the more advanced features of it are not very well supported across all browsers, but just basic gradients are supported very well. And um, border radius is also supported very well, and I think the newer versions of IE use it. I think before IE 8, they did not support it, so you'd have to use uh, like a shiv or a, um, one of those workarounds to have it show up in IE. Yes. There are several sites that um, go through all the CSS3 sure. features, and then by each browser and browser version, you know, check marker X or color code or whatever, because it is hard to keep track, and some of the things like generating content have been difficult for the browsers to implement. I don't know what's happened last year, but when CSS3 first came out, a number of the more sophisticated elements weren't implemented. Yeah, all the ones that I mentioned here are very well supported. Um, it used to be, even when I started giving this talk, I've been giving this talk or a different version of it since um, for like two years. And CSS in that time has changed a lot. Like I don't even, there's Flexbox now, which I don't really know very much about. Um, there's also box sizing, but all of these have come out relatively recently and they're all supported well across browsers. Oops. What happened to the light? <laughs> there we go. Um, there's yeah. a site called Can I Use. Oh, great, great yeah. site. Can I use yeah. dot com, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, W3, if you go to the link that I showed you on CSS3, it actually does tell you, like I believe on each one, how the browser support is for that feature on W3 schools. Yeah, it can get be very, very. Good. And they also give you the rationale behind the development of a particular feature or limitations in the feature. Mm -hmm. ex give you an explanation of sort of what, where it comes from and where they think they're going to go with things. You get some sense of whether it's worth putting time into something that's new uh, because it may be too new to actually make much use of. Um, and the other thing is that Eric Mayer is a guy who. That's a very important. <coughs> Eric Mayer. From way back. Yeah. Ago, 
he makes a really good, and I recommend this, that if you, if you build a, a style sheet from scratch, that you include some kind of a reset. And Eric Meyer is one of the more popular ones that gets included in a lot of the automatic themes. Basically what it does is, like all the different browsers have different defaults for heading sizes, for margins, for padding, for different HTML elements. They're all a little bit different. So if you're trying to get your web design to look the same in all the browsers, you might be fighting a losing battle if you're fighting with that kind of thing. So usually what I do at the very beginning of your style sheet is include this reset. And the reset includes elements that just kind of set everything back to like no padding, no margins, sets everything to a basic level so you're on a, on, on a straight playing ground. So I would definitely recommend that. Yes. This reset notion is to sort of take standards out of the hands of the browser people and put them in the hands of developers. Mm -hmm. and therefore, by zeroing everything out, in effect, make that the standard, and then you customize on top of something that you know, you know where you're starting from, and you don't have to worry about you know one version of ID, you know, quirks low doing something differently than the previous version of the thing that Microsoft gives you around the document. Awesome. Thanks. Yes. Yes. It allows you to change um, the uh, CSS code and then you can see it. Mm -hmm. You can't save it. So you cannot save it. So is there a third party? Uh, there is. I've, I haven't played with them, but I've heard that there are actually um, third party extensions that will allow that to be writable, but I haven't played with them. Uh, CSS Hero. CSS Hero is one. I've used it. Yeah, that's good. good. I'd like to check that out. CSS Hero. It's a WordPress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a WordPress. Is it? It's a plugin. Word, WordPress plugin that helps with that. Any other questions? <coughs> How much time do we have left? A little bit early. <laughs> I could show you guys something else. Let's see here. Oh, the link for the slides. Yes, I can do that. If you go to SlideShare. and then type in my name without spaces. The first one that comes up will be that one. Right there, how to use CSS3 in WordPress. And, um, oh, the light came on, so you can't even see that. I used to have a really good demo site, but I changed my theme to 2016, and now my demo site is broken. Um, but it does have some good examples in it. Let me see if I can find it. So the CSS is not there, but basically what I do on this, on this um, demo site, I'm gonna fix it. <laughs> I just need to add the, the CSS to the right place. Um, it takes like this basic um, code here, and then it applies like all the different things to it. There's colors, gradients, multiple background images. That's something that doesn't work. It works pretty good. Um, across browsers, depending. And then there's box shadows and text shadows. Like, hmm, and transforms, trans yeah, I had all of them on here, and I should have probably went through some of those. But you can't see any of the effects because the CSS isn't there. <coughs> Gradients. But um, the one thing that I thought didn't work well that I thought sounded really fun was border images. Border images work weird. <laughs> Border images work weird. Animations work. Trans all, everything right here seems to work really well. <laughs> Colors, yeah. Is there, did I see a question over here? No? All right. Well, thank you guys and have a great rest of your WordCamp. <laughs>